Welcome to episode number 163 of the Life Changing Questions podcast. On today's show, we have John Shigarian. John is a serial entrepreneur and is responsible for co founding Homebody Industries, FinancialAid.com, Engage, and many other impactful organizations. He currently serves as the co founder, chairman, and CEO of ERI, which is the largest cybersecurity focused hardware destruction and electronic waste recycling company in the United States. He's joining us uh, today from uh, his home in California. And John, I'm so excited to be connected with you today. Thank you so much, Kevin, for having me. It's an honor to be here. Well, John, it's, it's an honor for me. I looked through your profile and your background, and you have such a diverse range. I mean, we mentioned there already in the uh, the introduction, you know, financial aid. You also help have helped people over the years overcoming addictions. You have a business that helps uh, book you know talent speakers. Uh, you help businesses you know make marketing campaigns, and of course, you have uh, you know the United States' largest uh, you know uh, electronic waste recycling company. That that's such a broad range for uh, one person, you know one entity to to be creating so i'd love to hear a little bit about your background how have you uh arrived now at this place where you have the you know, the largest waste recycling company and and how does that tie with all of these amazing businesses that you've had over the years yeah i don't think it ties directly but it ties with the macro theme is this i'm a serial entrepreneur and i go into areas of business where i see an opportunity and uh i believe the opportunity uh, the solution to the opportunity, the solution to the void in the marketplace could be profitable, could be scalable, could be commercializable, and it also personal to me. There's got to be a personal attachment because what happens, Kevin, is as you get working along the way, there's always horrific near-death moments in any business enterprise's journey. And you've got to have a personal connection to making that business model succeed for you to make it through those near-death experiences. So those are the common themes to why I went into various different businesses. And as another note, people say, well, you weren't an expert in tech before you went into financialaid.com, nor you were, an, were you an expert when you went into hiring uh, former gang members for Homeboy Industries, nor did you have huge environmental experience working with electronics. And the answer to that is correct. And guess what? There's a huge advantage when you're an entrepreneur with a vision going in as a clean slate to an industry that you know nothing about, but you sense there's a massive opportunity in because you're not tied to all the legacy ideas and ways of doing things. So when people say, why do you do this? Well, because we've always done it that way. I have no association with, because we've done always done it that way, I look at it and say, what we're going to do. I don't dream about what could have been or what we've been doing. I dream about what could be. I love that. So actually, that's a, a real strong message for anyone listening. The the key thing here is to see the uh, you know the void in the marketplace and providing, I think you should say, profitable, scalable, commercial, and personal to you then of course, it doesn't matter if you have the expertise or not, you're going to be able to find a way in there, take your vision and help uh, create a solution or an outcome. Tell us uh, a little bit about your, you know, your latest uh, venture then. I know we mentioned your chairman and CEO of ERI. This is probably becoming uh, more and more topical as we use more and more hardware, more and more computers, you know, our personal data gets captured uh, on these devices. And then I guess once we finish with them, you know, what, what do we do with them? I, I know okay. I, I know I don't have a good solution for that. I you know, typically yeah. have these things set around my house, but uh, you know, what, what happens to them? What do we need to be thinking about there? That's the problem. There's a void in the marketplace, and that's what I do on a typical basis. I'm not a salesperson per se, I'm an educator because the truth is most good people like you uh, and most people are good and they want to live in a world and leave a world to their children and grandchildren that's a cleaner and better place. But the truth is, e-waste is the fastest growing solid waste stream in Australia, in California, in Paris, and around the world. And most people don't know what to do with it when it comes to its end of life. According to the United Nations, only 17% of all electronic waste all electronics that we're using now are being responsibly recycled at the end of life. That means there's an 83% opportunity in the United States and around the world to go make the world a greener and better place. And that's what we do. We re responsibly recycle 
old electronics, which if they get into our lakes or rivers or landfills, they are full of beryllium, lead, arsenic, cadmium, mercury, all sorts of bad things that are bad for our ecosystem, for our plants, our animals, and our people. We recycle them responsibly, keep them above ground, make sure that all the commodities are shred and then go to smelters around the world so we're zero waste, zero landfill, and zero emissions. So the environment wins, um, the, the planet wins as a whole because the circular economy is being sustained and pushed forward. And so it's a win-win-win for everybody. Plus now, Kevin, as you well know, most of our old electronics in 2023 and beyond contain a lot of data that it's nobody's business to see other people's or other businesses' data. We also, in the same process of protecting the environment, we, we destroy the data and protect the people and the organizations that we recycle for as well. Well, uh, I'm, I'm sure there's some politicians listening who would find that very valuable. I mean, we hear all sorts of things of, uh, you know, old computers or laptops uh, with data on there that they would prefer not to be seen. So uh, I think there's right. a definite market uh, for you there. You mentioned about the circular economy. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. What, what does that mean for people listening who haven't heard that term or don't connect with that term? What does that mean? It's a great point. It's a, it's a relatively new term that is being used more and more in our vernacular and lexicon around the world. And what it means is that we're switching all of us, all countries are now, uh, uh, you know, making a big move to get our eco economies and socially speaking to switch from a linear, which is a go and throw economy. You just use something and you throw it in the trash to a circular economy where we use something and then we figure out a reuse for it. And we don't just throw it into a landfill willy nilly. So tires used to be thrown into landfills. And, and, and clothing and food and electronics. And now we have the ability to keep all these very high volume products, not only out of the landfills, but responsibly recycled and then put back into the economy again without going into the la landfills and clogging up our environment and polluting our environment. It's it's super important, and I think you you made the key piece there around we want to leave the uh you know the planet in a better place than than when we found it, and this can be you know a key thing. We we have very much uh come to a place where we're consumers. We use use something, and I love your term there. We uh we you know we go and then we throw, and so how can we reuse it, recycle it, so that it's you know it doesn't go into that landfill? And as you were talking about all the chemicals uh you know in our products, I, I actually almost wanted to stand back and and not touch mine anymore. More. It's almost uh, it's pretty scary to think that, you know, we could be putting that into, you know, our water systems into the land. And of course, that's going to negatively impact, you know, uh, you know, all of the, the creatures and animals out there. And, and I guess, you know, longer term back to us. So it becomes very, very important. And I can understand why you have this passion and drive then to fill this void for the listeners. I understand that you're the largest uh, in the United States or any of the US listeners. That's that's great. They can contact you know you and go to your website. For people listening outside of the US, what options do we have? How can we be more involved in the circular economy and you know, responsibly uh, ha handle our, our waste? The good news is there's lots of great responsible recyclers and electronics around the world, wherever you live, whether it's Paris or Sydney, Australia, or uh, Mumbai or Dubai, There's we have lots of great partners. We have lots of great friends that are responsibly recycling your, your, your old electronics everywhere on the planet. Unfortunately, it's not easy to find everybody all the time, but most you could most of the time you could go into the, the search engines of your choice and type in responsible recycling of old electronics, and you'll be able to find a recycler in your region. You just have to look a little harder and you have to make sure that they're certified, certified either to e-stewards or R2, which is the environmental certifications that are the best, one or the other, or both, we're both, but one or the other is wonderful. And then also they should be certified for responsible hardware data destruction. And the best, best solution for that is to be NAID certified, National Association of information destruction. And that means that when they get your data, if you pay them and ask them to destroy your data that's inside of your old electronics, they will do so in a responsible way. 
I love that. So find certified brokers, uh, not just for the uh, data, which you said is at the NCAA, but also for the environmental certification to make sure that they're taking care of the planet as well as your, your data. Now, you've mm. written a book on this topic, and it's called The Insecurity of Everything. What, what are the key messages or what are the key things that people will learn from that? Okay, great. You've got right a here. As well. It's right here. And what I'll do is this. Um, it's a takeaway. The takeaway from this is everything that we touch now has our data in it, Kevin. And what I'll offer all your viewers and your listeners is if, if they write to you or write to me, and my email address is sort of easy, it's jss at eridirect.com. If they write to me and ask me for a free copy of the book, I'll send it to them, either a free copy or an electronic version of the book. And the bottom line is it basically explains how the Internet of Things, which has exploded the ubiquity of electronics. So, for instance, I'm wearing this wearable, this watch, this wonderful Garmin watch, and this Aura ring I'm wearing as my wedding ring. They're all collecting data on me. I don't want that data to be getting into the wrong people's hands. So I want to make sure I'm destroying the, the old electronics when they come to the end of life and the data, any data that they contain therein. So this book explains all the risks of data management in hardware for large and small organizations, and even for us for a common household. The risks that exist in your old copier machine. They have a hard drive. Every copy that ever is made on a copier machine or fax machine is in that hard drive. Do you really want that copier machine hard drive to get into the wrong people's hands or fax machine? Uh, probably not. Same thing if you go rent a car in a city that you're visiting and you're pressing the buttons to find your favorite music station or some other thing, and you're just pressing a lot of acceptance buttons along the way, and all of a sudden, it's downloading all the contacts from your mobile device, your tablet or your cell phone. And when you turn the car back in, unknowing to you, it has all the contact information in many cases, even your banking information and personal identification information in that car. That's not good for, for the security of your family. That's not good for the security of your company that you work for. Okay. Hey, if you're not feeling scared about that now, then, then maybe you should be because uh, you're talking about things you know that aren't continuing in our life, like a higher car that could have that data. I mean, I more worry about this thing, like the phone in that how much data is that tracking and collecting with the various apps that we have on there? You know, is everything. someone actually tapping into that? Yeah, I mean, everything. I, I mean, interestingly, I mean, we know that Google seems to even be able to track you when you have your data turned off. Like, so I don't I don't even know how how they do those kind of things. If you're not uh, tracking the data or sending the data, they, they still seem to know where you are and what you've been, Kevin, been doing. It, it, know, it knows what you've typed into the search engine, what you've looked for. It knows every physical location you've been to. It knows more about us than we even know. And there's no reason that good guys or bad guys should be looking at your family's information or the organization you work for's information. It's just not right. So this book, The Insecurity of Everything, explains it all in simple terms. It gives you some good solutions. And it talks about what to do with your old electronics and hardware when you when it comes to an end of life. I'm willing to give this to free as an education tool to all of your listeners and viewers. That's very generous. And uh, I, for one, will be getting a copy of that. And uh, just in case you didn't hear where to get that, it was to the email address jss at eridirect.com. And wherever you're listening, just check in the show notes and you just click on that and it will, it will go yes. straight through. And so you're talking about the end of life. I'm also concerned about the use, the, the during the life. You know, uh, and does your does your book go into that about what uh, what protections we can take so it doesn't capture that information in the first place? Yeah, it talks about cybersecurity and how to protect yourself. Um, during the pandemic, I actually enrolled at Harvard and MIT in uh, in in uh, to learn more about cybersecurity, and I got certificated at both great universities. And it is a scary world out there. And learning more and more how to protect yourself. So we do give some good easy tips in there on how to protect yourself more and more from the bad guys, because unfortunately, cybercrime is on the rise. The cyber criminals uh, successfully 
stole over $3 trillion in 2015. And just a mere six years later in 2021, they got away with $6 trillion. So crime is on the rise on a cyber basis. And we have to do everything we can, Kevin, to protect ourselves, our families, and the organizations that we are engaged with. It's a significant amount of money and it's on the rise. We see it more and more uh, in the news every day. And here, certainly here in Australia, we've had some major companies hacked and, and data stolen. Uh, here's the next question in that you're talking about wearables. I mean, you have that watch there, you have the ring, and I know there's certain things you put in your clothes and measure things. What about implantables? I can see more and more, you know, we're hearing the ideas of having things put into your body, like a chip put in your body to be able to yeah. track things, you know, maybe even have a little device here so you can beep, you can pay Fascinating. Things. So, you know, and- how I understand it, when I've had discussions with doctors that are already starting to work on this, this technology already exists. But here's the interesting fact that the chip is going to be implanted into us and it's going to be there the rest of our life. So there's really, God willing, not going to be an end of life of the chip that's implanted unless they have to take it out and replace it because it's damaged or some other thing happened to it. It got compromised. So those things are not going to be turned over as much as our cell phones and our tablets and our television sets and our hard, you know, other type of hard drive related material. But the chips are coming and they are going to change our lives uh, for the better. Uh, if we, if, you know, when they're used for the better in terms of tracking blood pressure and heart rate and, and sugar levels and intoxication levels, and they're going to be able to warn us if there's a potential crisis or some other thing happening. So medical, the the merging of longevity medicine uh, with the technology world is upon us. And those days of permanent chips are going to, are just a mere one or two years away when many of us, if not most of us will be uh, uh, getting chips implanted to us to just give us a longer and better and healthier life. And and that's interesting. I I mean, I have, you know, the pros and cons of this, I can hear all the good things you're saying about, hey, once we have this in us, then we can track what's going on in our body. We can be alerted to health problems before they become a problem. You know, we can, and you mentioned the intoxication piece. I know uh, there'd be times in my past where I would have loved to have had an alert to say, you should stop drinking now. Like that's, that's really enough for right. you. That would be super helpful. Right. Um, I'm also concerned about the other side of that in that you mentioned how you know, with the technology we have now, we things get hacked, money gets stolen, things get taken. If we have chips inside of us, what's what's the additional risk that we have there? Can can we as humans be hacked? Yeah, they, I mean, listen, I, with every good thing that there's out there, there's a dark side, Kevin. Ooh. And yes, I would be foolish to tell you that no, there'll be no hacking of those chips. Because honestly, even when it comes to the EV cars and self-driving autonomous vehicles, there's been already, you know, uh, cases uh, of hackers, both ethical and unethical hackers, being able to take over the autonomy of that car and drive a car just through a hacking event. So if that could be hacked, uh, I am sure, and everything else could be hacked, oh yes. The dark side of chip technology that will be implanted, yes, will be um, the ability of bad people with bad intentions to be able to hack um, those chips as well. Okay. And I appreciate I've gone a little little off piece of, you know, where okay. you're especially in, which is about the, you know, making sure yeah. we manage the waste responsibly. Uh, but That's I just okay. think it becomes an interesting thing because like you say, this is technically, you know, you know, uh, there's ability for this now. And we may be only a year or two or three away, you know, from this becoming yeah. more of a common thing in society. So it could be a a major shift. And so, as you say, with every technology, there are pros and cons. And I think we we need to be aware of that and manage that. I uh, certainly that the fear or the idea that someone can steal my money from my bank account is one thing, but the idea that they could hack my body and maybe get me to think things or do things in a way that wasn't uh, in alignment with how I'd yeah. like to think um, is is a little bit more concerning. But hey, you know, maybe they're already doing that anyway with the. Uh, you know, with the algorithms and what they put in front of us on computers, what they put in front of us on the TV anyway. So there's there's a whole combination yeah. of things where we're being influenced right now anyway. And, and hopefully, that even though that might be the case, and I, I, I dig longevity medicine, so I am big into this, hopefully the good will far outweigh the bad, which um, 
you know, which is just part of then the whole journey that we're all on together. And the, the good that it, that it does will outweigh the bad and we'll be able to minimize the bad by uh, having good people out there that catch the bad guys. I love that. Okay. And it's a fascinating topic and we're right on the edge here of uh, technology and how things are going to change and evolve. And for some people, this will be a new thing and others will kind of have the awareness. Yeah. Now, John, what I really uh, get about you is that you're out there looking for the voids. So you're going to be at the cutting edge, edge of things. You're going to see you know, the opportunities coming up or the problems that need to be resolved that aren't being resolved yet. Now, the kind of the premise of this podcast is around life-changing questions. And I wonder if there's a question that you've asked that's had the biggest positive impact on your life or the, the life of the customers that you serve. Yeah, uh, it's a great question, Kevin. And it evolves over time as we evolve. I'm 60 years old now. And, you know, like everything else, like every good person should, or every organism, we should evolve and try to, on a process basis, make ourselves better as we go. And originally that question, probably I would have answered, is do you have the ability to say no? Because that's a very hard thing to, to, to put off. But now my question is evolved into, do you have the ability to persist and resist? And what I mean by that is this. A, life gets difficult. There's nobody that gets through this whole journey unscathed. And whether that means personal issues, business and entrepreneurial issues, whatever it is, we're all going to continue to face challenges. So we have to have that ability and the desire to always persist and work our way through those. So A, do you have the ability to persist? when the going gets tough and when life throws you curveballs that you weren't expecting, didn't want and didn't deserve. That's just the way it is. And um, that's number one. Do you have that ability? Number two is the, is the backside of that. Do you have the ability to resist? What I mean by that is this, the ability to say no. Now, years ago, that would have been the, what I, what I used to tease my children about is Jomo. You know, FOMO is a real thing, fear of missing out. And I told my kids, listen, your dad has JOMO, and I want you to develop that, the joy of missing out. Mm -hmm. Because when you have a vision or a desire to succeed and, and, and or make, a, make some sort of leave a mark on this planet and, and achieve the goals that you set out to do, you can't get distracted. So the ability to resist has has even grown in importance. Whereas uh, you, I used to say the ability to say no, and now I say the ability to resist. And what I mean by that clearly is this, it's much more than JOMO. It's much more than saying no to your buddies who are going to the pub on a Friday night or to a movie on a Saturday night uh, or, so, or some other social event. It's the ability to also resist getting caught in the, in the black hole and vortex of things that are out of our control that are going on around the world, such as when last year, when China was on zero COVID policy, hey, that's their decision. And it's I can't control that. And we have to watch how that evolves. Nor can I control what's going on in Ukraine and Russia. I have a tremendous empathy for that horrific situation and tragedies that are going on. But again, stuff that's out of my control. It's out of my control that Jerome Powell comes on television every week or every other week and says, <clears throat> a recession's coming. I'm going to keep raising interest rates out of my control. You've got to resist getting overwhelmed by both this, this, the, the, all the versions of media used to be the traditional forms of media, both newspapers and magazines and the major networks. Now it also includes all this unbelievable, um, patchwork quilt of social media that inundates us with information, both true and false information. And there's sometimes no way of figuring out what's true or false. You have to resist all of it and literally put yourself in a hyper-focused mode of focusing on the task at hand and what you've set out to accomplish in life. And you have to resist all that. You have to resist it all. And, and focus on what is in your own hands and what you can control. And then you have, to, you have to improve that on a daily basis. And if you have that ability to both persist when the curveballs come, when the potholes come, when the tragedies come, when the outside circumstances look 
taller than you ever wanted to or imagine you could climb and the ability to resist all the noise and just focus on the signal, you will be a massive success. But the ability to persist and resist and toggle between both and hold both in the same hands all at once as you work through what you're working through is really the great art of entrepreneurship now. And that's the question I ask myself every day. And that's the question I ask of every entrepreneur who comes to me and looks for advice. I wanna see their ability to persist and resist, not only through words, but through action. And therein will lie the next great entrepreneur. So much power and so much wisdom in that. And I've never heard of the idea of JOMO. Uh, we can get so focused on the fear of missing out, but there's joy of missing out. Okay, that's got oh. a nice flavor to it. Yeah, it's got a real I, nice flavor I to it. I will be at work. I will be in bed. I'll be at my desk at home or office, and I'll be thinking about what everybody else is doing. And I'll take so much joy in, in the flow state that I'm able to get into because the peace and quiet that exists on a Friday or Saturday or Sunday afternoon when everybody else is doing something else that really wasn't going to improve my circumstances or make me a better or bigger person um, or improve my business, which is all at the end of the day falls on me and my partners. No one's going to bail us out if we don't make progress, except ourselves. Our friends who are out having fun at the pub or at the movies or at some social on a Sunday afternoon are not going to come to our rescue. So that's in our own hands, and we have to take it upon ourselves to continue to improve not only ourselves on a regular basis, but our companies on a business, regular basis, and then totally enjoy the JOMO that they get out of that. Two, two really important steps in this process then. Number one is having that thing that you're focused on. I hear it very clearly, like laser-like focus. So if you're not really focused on this, something that you want to achieve, accomplish, work on, or avoid that you want to fail, that probably becomes first. Otherwise, uh, all these other uh, distractions, these things that are overwhelming, these other requests, well, they may look more shiny, more interesting if you're not having a clear focus. And once you have that clear focus, take joy in the fact that you're staying on that path. Uh, John, it very much reminds me of um, an Olympic rower uh, who won a gold medal in the Olympics. And he asked the question, you know, will it make the boat go faster? Now, I like that because he's very focused on if someone comes to him and said, hey, let's go to the pub on a Friday night. He's like, well, that's not going to make my boat go faster. No, thanks. And he, you know, he was just purely determined on that one thing. Your idea takes that to the next level is like, it's not only saying no and feeling bad about it, it's actually taking the joy in the fact that you're on your track, you're doing your thing, you get it in flow. And I think that's such a, a beautiful thing. So the question, if you didn't capture it, is then you know, do you have the ability to persist and resist? Now, if someone doesn't have that ability to persist and resist, what are some of the things that they can do to, uh, you know, to uh, harden that muscle, build that skill? It's just a muscle. You have to practice it. You have to practice it. You have to practice doing hard things. You have to practice being comfortable, being uncomfortable. And, and that's, that's the persistent side. On the resistance side, you have to practice being comfortable saying no to people, saying no and resisting. And you have to also show self-discipline, not picking up your phone every five seconds and looking at Instagram, Snapchat, um, uh, Facebook, uh, TikTok. They all have great, qualities that yes, make us more connected when used appropriately um, and can do wonderful things in spreading information when necessary. But we have no business checking our social media on an every five or 10 or 15 minute basis. It's a massive destruction of our, of our thought process, of our flow state, of our flow state. And it only feeds our either diagnosed or undiagnosed ADD or ADHD. No, no, there's no reason you've got to break that habit and train yourself to focus in at your task at hand and do the work. Don't do the easy stuff and get let the distractions get in the way of doing the real work. Very powerful message. Uh, train yourself to be focused and do the work. And this has uh, no place, you know, if you're trying to accomplish something, you know, fill a void in the industry, then, you know, tapping on that phone, checking in, you know, <laughs> uh, fearing that you're missing out what someone's eating for breakfast that day, then you need to, to push that to one and side. And, and you practice in so many ways. Go to dinner with your family, your husband, your wife, your brothers, your sisters, your parents, and leave your phone aside. 
Go to bed at night and leave your phone in the kitchen. Don't bring it in the bedroom. Leave your iPad in the kitchen, your laptop in the kitchen. Don't bring it in the bedroom. Read a book. Watch a little telly if you need to. But you don't. Don't turn on the news 24-7 and, and, and get affected by every new story that they like to um, put out there. They get they sell soap and they sell their advertising by literally showing all the worst things that are going on around the world. They're not typically reporting on good and happy stories. It's not going to bring you any joy doing that. So find something that feeds your brain, that feeds your soul and makes you a better person, whether it's about meditation, whether it's about health and the good ways to exercise and eat, find ways to improve yourself so you can bring your best self to whatever venture you've taken on and whatever goals you've set out to do. Don't do things that, that take away from you or make you less than and be, degrade your mind and your soul by interrupting whatever flow you're into. So much wisdom, so much power in there. And uh, you're right with the news. If it uh, bleeds, it leads. So you're going to find a lot of uh, you know fear and uncertainty created there. So fill your mind with the things that are going to keep you on track with your goal and filling these voids. John, there's so much power in here. And you, you showed some really important habits there, particularly like this habit uh, you know, before you go to bed, have a great routine for your mind with the great things. Um, in a previous episode, we've had uh, Maya Cleggett, who is a an expert in you know managing the subconscious and feeding your brain with the right things. And of course, she would echo exactly what you said: read something empowering before you go to bed, visualize or focus on the things you want to accomplish. Um, it could be the very very worst thing, of course, for you to sit there and watch something you know bloody and violent and you know uh, like the news or or some kind of Netflix, because then that's what yeah. your brain is processing in the evening. So have that last thought: uh, focus on the thing you want to achieve or to accomplish, or see things go in the way that you want them to go in the world. 100, 100. Visualizing is a very powerful tool. Um, my wife was usually just recently taking some medicine and, and, and she needed to help her ears get well. And I said, after I helped her put in the drops at night and she took the medicine orally, and then I put the drops in, I said, as you fall asleep, I told her, just visualize that medicine making your ears better. It's powerful. Our minds are our mission control of everything that we're doing. And so I try to visualize everything. I don't try to visualize catastrophic events in my life. I visualize things working out, whether that's personal relationships, business relationships, deals that I'm working on, goals that I have, I visualize them working out. When they don't or when challenges come up along the way, I deal with them at that moment. But I don't catastrophize everything that, that's going on in my life and and and. If you catastrophize everything, you'll just get frozen and do nothing on a regular basis. Nothing of value, at least. It's so true. And so true. We can get caught in that habit of seeing things going the way we don't want them to go or seeing the worst outcome. And it's amazing once you create that habit of dropping that and seeing things go the way you want them to, then it is more motivating. You want to take the action. You want to go towards that. You want to find a way to make that happen. John, you, you shared so much value in here today. And I think this question for anyone listening, then again, just to repeat it is, do you have the ability to persist and resist? Make sure you're focusing on uh, not FOMO, but JOMO, this joy of missing out and feeling uh, yeah. proud that you're focused yeah. and that you're on track. Now, for everyone listening, uh, there's a couple of opportunities here. John has offered for you to uh, very generously offer to get you a copy of this book, The Insecurity of Everything. And it's certainly uh, something I can get my hands on too, because with all this data that we have around us, we want to make sure that we protect that and look after ourselves and our family. And you know, particularly if we're hearing that, you know, cyber crime is on the rise, six, six trillion dollars was stolen last year. And it sounds like it's on an upward trend. So do you have everything in place to protect yourself? And are you, uh, you know, dealing with, you know, your waste electronic equipment in the right way? And number two, of course, you, you can get that at JSS at ERI direct.com. And if you wanted to find out more about that business, you can go to the, the website as well, ERI direct.com. Uh, John, is there anywhere else uh, that people would, would be, uh, you know, best to get connected with you or those are the, are the right places? Yeah, I really don't use social media. Like I said, I do use LinkedIn and people could connect with me at LinkedIn. It's a very great business tool. And uh, professionally, I'm happy to accept people linking in with me. So you can go find me on LinkedIn. There's only one John Shigarian on LinkedIn. And I'd be happy to connect with you if you'd like to connect with me and see what's going on. I post on there regularly uh, as, a, as a business tool to explain what we're up to and how we're, how we're, how we're navigating the journey. 
Beautiful. And uh, wherever you're listening, check out the show notes and uh, John's link will be there. Uh, John, do you have any final messages you'd like to share with the listeners today? No, I'm very bullish on 2023. Someone asked me this earlier today. Am I worried about a recession? I said, recession? Heck no. Our company had our best year last year than we've ever had before. We're going to beat those numbers this year. I don't even think there's going to be a recession. China's opening up. People who haven't been to China don't understand the power of China. I've been going to China since uh, 1993. The power of China and their economy and their people is massive. And I think it's going to make a real positive impact on the world in 2023 and way beyond. So I'm very bullish on, on the good things that are happening on this planet. And, uh, and I'm very excited just to have shared this time with you, Kevin. I love the positivity of your podcast. I love what you're doing. And it's been a real honor and joy to be with you here today. Yeah, the honor and the joy is all mine. Uh, I'm so thankful that we've had this time. And uh, really, there's some, some positive actions for us all to be taking from this today. So, John, uh, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. <laughs>